Hello, and welcome to Law Talk. I'm your host, Mitchell Panter. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Panter, Panter, and San Pedro. We're going to talk a little bit today about some commercial litigation and some bankruptcy with our guest, Jeffrey Bast. But first, let me tell you a little bit about what this is all about. So many years ago, my brother, Brett Panter, and myself, we were with the law firm of Panter and Panter at the time, had a TV show on uh, local news, and it was called Law Talk. And what we did was we would bring on different people from the community dealing with legal issues. We had the state attorney, we had public defenders, we had judges, we had politicians. And our goal was to educate you, to talk to you a little bit about the legal issues in our community and how they would affect you. Fast forward many years later, the law firm is now Panter, Panter, and San Pedro. We are a law firm dedicated to protecting Florida's families. And in connection with that, what we did was we formed the Panter, Panter, and San Pedro Network. What we did is we reached out to the local community of our many, many lawyers, and we tried to pull the best out of the crowd. And what we did was we talked to these people. We met with them. Jeffrey's one of those people that we met with. And we decided that we were going to never say, I don't do that. Our goal was when clients called, customers called, people called us, we wanted to be able to say, we don't do that in our firm because our firm is a personal injury firm, but we know somebody that does that. And in meeting with people, we developed a great relationship with everybody. So now when you call, no matter what the question is, we're able to say, hold on, let me refer you to one of our people in our network. Our network currently consists of about 150 members in Miami-Dade County and 50 in Broward. And these lawyers can handle everything from immigration to real estate, to probate, to criminal law, to civil law, you name it. We got members in it that can do it. We're very fortunate today to have Jeffrey Bast with us. Jeffrey, pleasure to meet you. Introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, I'm Jeff Bast. I uh, own and operate a law firm called Bast Amron. We specialize in business reorganization, bankruptcy, and, and commercial litigation. But I, when you, if you ask me what who I am, I would say I'm a father and a husband and uh, a swimmer, a lover of the environment before any of those other things. That's funny you said that because last week we had a lovely young lady, Ms. Sheehy, uh, and what she did was horses. Oh, uh, yeah. She did equine law, but she was real. Her passion was horses. So when you say you're a father and a husband, all that, give us a little history. Tell us who you are and what uh, that means. Well, I'm a second generation native Floridian. My father was born in Miami Beach. Uh, my wife is also a native Floridian. Uh, but we have three kids. Two of them are away in college, one at University of Colorado in Boulder which is a great place to visit. Another one at University of Pennsylvania, also a good place to visit. But And my and my third is a junior in high school at, at, here at Ransom Everglades. Awesome. Tell us about your work history. How'd you get to where you are currently? I'm a, uh, I'm a former big firm lawyer. I practiced, uh, well, I did two judicial clerkships at, at a law school. I went to law school in New York, NYU, and I did two clerkships. I clerked for a bankruptcy judge in Dallas, Texas for a year. And then I came out here to Miami and I clerked for a district court judge who had been assigned to handle all of the bankruptcy appeals for the district. And after that, I went to big law. I did a stint at Holland and Knight, where I rose the ranks up to equity partner, jump ship to Hunton and Williams, also equity partner. And then after uh, 15 or so years in big law, I decided I wanted to start my own firm. And I met my partner. That was in 2008. I met Brett, around, Brett Amron around that time. And we form a firm in 2009. He had done the same thing. He was a former big firm lawyer who started his own firm. We were bouncing ideas off of each other. And what are you doing for, you know, malpractice insurance or what, what, what service do you use? And next thing you know, we decided to form a firm. And when we announced it to the bankruptcy bar, we were at a retreat. Everybody said, oh, we knew that was happening. So apparently we were the last ones to find out. Well, that's interesting. But it's tell me a little bit well. about... How did you get into bankruptcy and the judge, the judicial clerk yeah. that you did? What's that um, about? It's interesting. I, I was an accounting major undergrad, and my plan was always I'm going to sit for the CPA exam after law school or during law school. I had this idea that I would uh, you know, take on something else while I was in law school. It was a little naive of me. Uh, and so I went to NYU, which was the top tax school in the country, and my plan was to study tax. My first tax class was taught by the commissioner of the irs wow and i hated it <laughs> <laughs> i did not like it and that just turned me off the tax and somebody suggested bankruptcy is a very similar it's a financially driven program it has a code um and so i looked into bankruptcy and i ended up interning for a bankruptcy judge during the summer and then started my next summer i started doing a little bit more bankruptcy assignments at a, at a law firm and and then landed a clerkship with a bankruptcy judge 
And what I learned, you know, through the years was that, and what I like about it is it's very much a multidisciplinary practice. It's I'm in court more often than litigators because bankruptcy cases happen very quickly and we have hearings all the time. Uh, but we also, you know, sell assets and negotiate with uh, landlords and deal with employment issues and tax issues. And so we deal with really every area of the law, uh, work with teams of lawyers most often. And, uh, you know, in a Chapter 11 reorganization where you're restructuring a business, you're looking at all aspects of that business. Right. So I like it. It's really um, uh, and, and it's a it's a fascinating area of the law and it allows us to help people who have uh, are struggling you know, having difficulty either in their life or their business and oftentimes those two are the same people, many people who are having financial difficulty or their business is struggling they've invested their whole lives into this business and to to see it fall apart is you know i've had people you know adults break down crying in my conference room on a regular it's basis yeah they've, they've exactly they've, 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 yeah they spent their whole lives building these things and then I'm a I'm sort of a last chance opportunity. You know, people come to me. Uh, I'm a doomsday guy. They come to me when everything is, you know, is, things are broken and I'm trying to fix it. And, we're, and, we're, and, you know, bankruptcy, I think, is one of those areas that's largely misunderstood by right. a lot of people. But it's something it's a it's an amazing tool that allows for a fresh start. And, you know, our society is built on that that notion it's in the you know the constitution our forefathers thought it was important to have uniform laws of bankruptcy because we deserve second chances people make mistakes and in my office i say all the time this is why pencils have erasers there you go well let me back up a little bit because it's really interesting i know my first few years out i did insurance defense work which gave me an opportunity to learn a little bit about the other side how they handle it and and you work for a judicial clerkship and the, the people out here might not know that but that's a big to do number right. one to get the job but then once you get the job how did that experience working for a judge or several judges as you did shape your current practice and beliefs and understanding and knowledge of the law um well I, you know there's so many answers to that i i would say it's a great question but i would say that clerking for a bankruptcy judge or clerking for a judge and any, any law students out there who are listening to this i highly recommend it judicial clerkships an incredible experience for so many reasons first you're you get in the, the head of the mind of a federal judge to understand what's important what's not important you know what guides their decision making second you're you get to sit in court and watch a whole cadre of, of practitioners but both sides both sides all yeah. good bad small large you know just every different type of 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 tact and approach and skill and basically handpick i like this i didn't like that and you also they did get this to see, good they didn't do this right good. exactly and you and the judge also will comment hey this is a great presentation this is a great great i love this brief it's very compelling and so i think whether you are whether i was aware of it or not at that time i picked up you know the the skills that i thought were useful and helpful um and the second my second clerkship was handling appeals so now i get to look at what went wrong in the court below and fix and it. and try to help fix it so it's um and how long did you do that for each one was a one-year term okay a lot of uh, clerkships i think a lot of judges are moving towards two-year terms nowadays but back you know back in those days it was a one-year term which um which is, you know, it's a great experience out of law school. When I was considering my second clerkship, I, I was interviewing with law firms and then I this clerkship came about. I was talking to some, you know, some lawyers in the in the field and they said, oh, why shouldn't I start? And they said, look, you know, at, at the, in 20 years, all of your colleagues will have 20 years and you'll have 18 years and two years of clerkship. So right. it's not, you know, there's and not great a great experience and, and this amazing experience. Exactly. You can't so. beat that. All right. So let me tell us a little bit about what is bankruptcy court and how does that work? Our court system, we we work with what's called the circuit court system. So cases that currently have a value of more than 30,000, we do personal injury, medical malpractice, right. products liability. We have a system where we have a judge and then we have a jury. Sometimes you can have a bench trial, but it's a different courthouse than the bankruptcy court. You guys have a separate court, separate judicial system. How do your how do your trials go? How does that all work? We have a we have a separate courthouse. Um, we have actually the bankruptcy court in Southern District of Florida has moved a couple of times, but the the bankruptcy court is basically an arm of the district court. 
Um, it is um, the the bankruptcy judges are Article One judges as opposed, to, as opposed to Article Three of the of the U.S. Constitution. They're not lifetime appointments. They are fourteen year appointments. Um, and, and who appoints them? The circuit court. The okay. circuit. Okay. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. They are still federal judges. They are appointed by the president. But I think they're suggest the recommendations by the by the circuit court. But it's not like a a, a local. Uh, by the way, I was not... told there would not I would not be tested today. Am I not? No, it's, it's, I don't, it's, I... I'm just trying. The differentiation is we have judges that have to run yeah. and they have no, to raise money. No, they do money, not. They're not. They're appointed and they're, they're appointed and it's a fourteen. Right. Year. Yeah. There you go. Um, try the overwhelming majority of trials are bench trials. And the only time a bankruptcy court will have a jury trial is if both parties consent which almost never happens. What's the pros I've and never cons seen, of bench versus... I've never seen, I'm, I, I'm not aware of any jury trial being conducted in bankruptcy court, at least in the Southern District Why not? of Florida. Um, I think I think parties recognize these are commercial transactions. Overwhelming majority of circumstances that are going to be disputed are not going to be jury to begin with. There's they're not, complex they're, issues they're complex well. issues. Um, but, uh, but more importantly, the bankruptcy judges are specialists. So when you appear in circuit court, the you know on a on a personal injury case, the case before might have been uh, a breach Real of contract or a dog bite or something else. In bankruptcy court, all they do is bankruptcy. So they're they're specialized. They see these types of matters uh, on a regular basis. Um, most of the trials that occur are complex commercial cases that are worthy and and are appropriate for a bench trial. I am. I've been practicing almost thirty years. I had my first two jury trials uh, three years ago in two thousand eighteen. Those are the first jury trials I ever in the even, bankruptcy court. No, or? they were okay. they were in state court. I do commercial litigation as well, but I just most of my practice is in bankruptcy, so I had never even seen a jury trial uh, until two thousand eighteen. You know, Twenty five years in, into right. my practice, and uh, it was an amazing experience. But it's just not something we do a lot in, in bankruptcy court. Understood. So. Bankruptcy by itself is an interesting breed, and and most people don't really understand it. We know there's commercial bankruptcy, where it's a business. There's right. personal bankruptcy, several different types. What are the different types of bankruptcy, and how are they handled differently or the same? So the most common ones are Chapter Eleven, Chapter Seven, and Chapter Thirteen. Those are the ones you're going to hear about on a daily basis. Um, chapter Seven is, I would say, uh, is liquidation. Chapter what, seven what liquidation, liquidation mean? means either an individual or a business is going to basically hand over all of its assets to a trustee appointed by uh, uh, by the court on a panel. It's there. There is a panel in each district of trustees. One of my partners, Scott Brown, is a panel trustee in Miami. So if if you filed a chapter seven, a trustee would be appointed. If Scott was appointed as your trustee, he would it would be his charged to take control of your assets and liquidate them, turn them into cash and use the money to pay creditors. And But your assets are fixed on a certain day, the date of the petition. It's called the petition date. But they include not only it's it's everything you own and all rights you have. So if you have a right to payment, if somebody owed you money, for example, Scott inherits that right. And his so it's his job to collect that money from a third party. So he may retain counsel to pursue claims. But we also have what's called a look back period. And that look back period, it looks at what, what did you do with your assets over the period before you filed? Did you transfer things? Did you pay off a debt to your cousin? And Scott is gonna look at those and scrutinize those transactions and in a, if there, appropriate, how far recover back does that. that go? Uh, it's a, there's a four year look back under okay. most state laws for fraudulent transfer, meaning you made a transfer with either the intent to hinder, delay or defraud a creditor, or you transferred it and you didn't receive value in exchange so at I'm a planning time on filing for bankruptcy and I get rid of all my cash. And, and if I do it fraudulently, I'm busted. Even if, I, if you don't do it fraudulently, if you let's say you have a, a car and it's worth twenty thousand dollars and you des and you're desperate and you sell it for five thousand dollars in an arm's length transaction, Scott may be able to pursue that the recipient of that car because they received twenty thousand dollars of value and you only got five. And so who who's who suffers? Your creditors, right. the people you owe money to. Now, there's a lot of defenses uh, to that to that cause of action. But if anyone unloads their assets or starts moving things around before bankruptcy, he's going to get they're going to they're, so they're the, going to be scrutinized. The moral to this story, at least in this circumstance, is consult with 
you, Jeffrey, before, prior to thinking yeah, about We bankruptcy. always tell people yeah. before you think about, before you move any assets, right. before you pay anything off or don't pay someone or move something, please call us. Right. Uh, because most of those things can't be undone. And the, the problem with those transactions is even if you undo it before the the analysis looks at the intent at the time of the transfer. Right. So even if you didn't know and then you come to a lawyer, it could be too late. So anyway, that's chapter seven. That's right, liquidation. Me, well, then, so, and that's only as to individuals. Those are individuals or businesses. Okay. And I know that folds into our, our, our business because we have clients often that are involved in a personal injury accident and they get hurt and they have a claim and the claim is right. pending. Um, and all of a sudden now they're in bankruptcy. The claim no longer belongs to them, but now it belongs to you. The trustee. Not you, but the trustee. The trustee. It belongs to their creditors. Correct. The and so we continue to represent and do the best we can. But any monies that we recover is not going to necessarily go to that individual, but rather to the estate, I think is the correct terminology. And, and that's that how it works. Correct. We continue to and are able to pursue our claim and it becomes part of the person's asset. Yes. And I don't I don't know if we want to veer this much into the into the weeds, but you need to be retained by the trustee. OK, so if you're continuing to work for the debtor who does no longer controls that claim, that may you may be you may have a problem on your hand because okay. when you want to collect your fee, you, if you haven't been retained by the trustee with court approval, you may have a you, and we've we've you gone down that road right and your we fee. haven't been kicked off. We've always been uh, retained by I guess, but I guess if the scenario is where the lawyer, the trustee doesn't trust the responsibility of that lawyer or the respect of that lawyer, they can go get their own lawyer and and that lawyer is just out and the new lawyer steps in. But we've always been able to talk to the trustee immediately and say, hey, this is who we are, what we do, let us stay on. And we promise, if you will, that that, that the monies are gonna go to the trustee, not to the individual. And as long as we're honest about that, that seems to work out for us. Attorney compensation is approved by the court. Right. So that's exactly. what, what you that know, too. Is, that's the issue for you is you wanna make sure that the trustee retains you and has the court approve your compensation Got it. so that you can receive it. All right, 11 uh, or 13, what's so next? So 11 and 13 kind of go hand in hand. They're okay. both reorganization. And the idea of a, an 11 or a 13, 13 is only for individuals and 11 is for high net worth and individuals and businesses. But the idea is that the debtor in that instance, a business or an individual is going to reorganize. And in, in the case of business, the 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 the, the idea is that we're all better off if this business survives. The creditors are better off, even if they don't receive 100 cents on the dollar, they may may receive only a small portion of what better they're owed, nothing. but they're gonna get something and they won't lose their, their customer, vendor, whatever it is, whatever the relationship is. And all the employees of this company will retain their employment if the business survives in some form or fashion. So uh, in the chapter 11, the debtor files and proposes a plan of reorganization over which it's it's really a plan that provides for the payment of the creditors over a period of time. How that plan, plan is really important from what I understand and how is that plan formulated the plan and carried out? plan takes into account the person's assets and earning capability or the business's assets and earnings capability and projects out what they're, what that's gonna look like, or look, look like over a period of time, usually three to five years, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter and proposes to pay creditors in accordance with that with that plan and then creditors have a right to vote um on the plan and then it has to be court approved so there's a whole there's a whole process what's the trustee's involvement in that as compared to just the debtor the person so that's the company there is no trustee in a chapter 11. in a chapter 11 we have what's called a debtor in possession so the debtor remains in possession of their assets so if a company files chapter 11 management stays in place unless there's somebody moves for the appointment of a trustee which is on the basis of either fraud or mismanagement they can have a trustee appointed um in a chapter 13 there is a chapter 13 trustee who really administers the case who take to collects the plan payments and then pays the creditors but it's not um it's not as as controlling as a chapter seven trustee chapter, chapter seven trust, all in all out they take control of everything other than exempt assets and they liquidate them and turn them to cash and pay creditors so let me backtrack a bit so the chapter seven is an individual the individual gives everything in they get everything out what happens to that person on a go forward basis their their credit rating their ability to buy a house a mortgage um the creditor relations how, how does that person go forward after the bankruptcy Okay. Again, again, you 
you, you, you ask tough questions, Mitch. <laughs> I like it. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there, there are many aspects to that, the, to that answer. The answer is on the day you file a petition in chapter seven, the estate is created. It's everything you own and every right you have. And I always like to draw the analogy of a dollar. So the, 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 the metaphor of a dollar. So if you owned a dollar, if you had a dollar in your pocket and you filed chapter seven, that dollar is property of the bankruptcy estate. If you file a bankruptcy and the next day you find a dollar on the street, that's yours. You, after that wasn't the filing after of. the day, the day after okay. that's yours. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't have a right to it. You didn't own it and you didn't have a right to it at the time you filed. And so if, if for example, if you're working your wages post petition, are not property of the estate even if in you know you're seven. going to get that money down well, the road the question is whether you had an entitlement to it okay. if you had a right to it so if you were the owner of the business then you have a right to the earnings of the business even earned post petition but going back to the dollar let's say instead of a dollar it's a lottery ticket if you bought a lottery ticket the day before and it's worth a million dollars and it wins even though the, the it declaration the it wins the day after you bought it oh. that day that's property That's a good of case. the estate. I like that one. That's interesting. If the same thing, if you find a lottery ticket the next day, <laughs> that's after. That's yours. That's right. post petition. So okay, uh, the petition date uh, creates everything. a line, and there's a there's a as you can imagine, these are the types of issues that get sure. litigated in bankruptcy court. They're complex issues as to whether or not somebody had an asset. What did they own? Did they control it? People try to get cute and transfer assets and put them in sure. somebody else's name. And so we look behind those things. Um, but you how, also how does a about, person get affected? I mean, I've always heard this thing about you have to wait seven years. And after it, seven years, it does affect repaired. your credit. A filing okay. of a bankruptcy is something that's picked up by the credit rating, rating agencies. The one comment I typically make is that most people in this situation who are filing a bankruptcy already have credit that's pretty bad to begin Obviously. with. So, yes. Bankruptcy affects your credit. Yes, it, it does stay on your record for what is, is seven typically years seven years. Okay. It's I don't I'm, I'm not aware of any. There's no law or anything right. that says that, but that is what I understand to be typically uh, the case. But what I've told people is, with the passage of time, you have to restore your credit, and there are lots of you know vehicles for doing that. They have secured credit cards where you put up assets or funds to secure the credit card and and you basically have to build up your credit over time so but what, you start with a fresh you know, a fresh start a fresh but start so, so clean how, does, slate. how does that fresh start how do you and if you do i'm not sure if you do or you don't but i i know one of the things that we do when we represent people and they have a large recovery we try to work with them to to structure their money their structured settlement or mm -hmm. annuities or something yeah. like that what can you do or maybe it's something you don't do to help people on a go forward I mean, basis we can give them some guidance my paralegals have you know have access to resources they will typically refer them to certain uh, agencies that that can assist there are firms out there that do credit restoration right. uh, that's not something that we do specifically but we also try to help them plan it out before so for example if they if you know we'll talk to them about, about their lifestyle and and we spend a lot of time with our debtors before we file they they we do a lot of practice sessions with them I, as i mentioned i have a trustee they're going to do a practice session with a real trustee okay. you know, he's obviously practicing not going to be what? practicing for because they're going to testify okay. in a, in what's called a creditors meeting where the trustee asks questions so you know they'll be well prepared but one of the things we'll consider is what's life going to be like after so are they going to have to rent a, an apartment or a, a car the taken away. because if they're going to do need to do that then we're going to try to line that up before they file okay. so if they need a new car lease let's get that before we file bankruptcy it's going to be more difficult after sure. uh, so things like that a lot uh, uh, there's a lot of planning involved in uh <clears throat> in a bankruptcy filing business right. or, or so let's or take it the next step reorganization what does that mean how does somebody reorganize as compared to just starting over <clears throat> it's the same it's almost the same thing depending if it's an individual or a business the overwhelming majority of our clients are business clients um but for for to to make it uh, more understandable to talk about a person a, a person's gonna project out their income they're gonna we're gonna list out all their creditors and all of their assets and we're gonna put the creditors in classes uh based upon their um their their the, the, the qualities of the claim if it's a secured claim it will be separate from an unsecured claim for example um 
Let me stop. And we're going to propose you're, you're saying things that that I want everybody to understand. There's <clears throat> types of or classes. What's secured versus unsecured? A what secured does that mean? creditor has an interest, has a security interest in some asset. So a, a car financing, you know, the vehicle financing, the, the the financing company has an interest in the car. If you don't pay them, they take the car back. Okay. Uh, a mortgagee, a mortgagee has an interest in in the house. So it's it's somebody who has an interest in assets. Most bank loans are secured in, in business in the business world. There's they might be secured by all assets. There's we call that a blanket lien. They have a lien on all assets, accounts receivable, uh, intellectual property, basically everything. And so and then other creditors are just vendors who sell a product or service and they're unsecured. They 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 provide the service on credit and they get paid later okay. in time. So secured creditors preserve their security interest in bankruptcy. They if and that all even that has a, a nuance to it. It depends on the value of their collateral. And so I, I you know, we could we could go down a lot. Got it. Of I'm just trying to get the distinction hole. between those. And I, I guess the, the secured creditor is going to be obviously better off than the unsecured creditor by virtue of a, their their line. Secure creditor is always line. better off okay. than an unsecured creditor. They have they have a lot of leverage. Um, first mortgage, second mortgage, obviously first mortgage is right. Is and better. if the house is worth less than the second mortgage, and the second mortgage is less than the Out first, then the second mortgage is really unsecured because there, there there is no, no money there. Okay. So all right. So reorganization. We got five minutes left. Give us a how does that work? Reorganization is going to basically formulate a plan using the income and assets of the company or individual to pay creditors over time and that it really depends on the assets and income and earnings that are projected to determine what amount the creditors will get sometimes it's 10 cents on the dollar sometimes it's 100 cents on the dollar but it varies based on uh the particular circumstances of the business so you get a plan they pay back 10 cents 15 cents whatever it is and then they go at about the end their of business. that time yeah they, there's a uh there is a, a discharge and an injunction that precludes the creditors from collecting over and above what's set forth in the plan and what happens essentially to the, business? the business continues to operate okay with a, with a, I don't want to say clean slate, but with it's a, a clean. Yeah, it is. It's everybody's a, it's, paid off. And it's a clean balance sheet. It really is an opportunity for a business to get a, a fresh start, and it, it it can be a long and cumbersome and costly process. But I should mention that uh, right just prior to the pandemic, in February of 2019, um, the Small Business Reorganization Act passed through Congress and became effective in February, and that enacted a smaller, more seam. Uh, a more um, streamlined component of chapter 11 small business it's called okay. the sub chapter 5 and it was originally for businesses with less than two and a half million dollars in debt total and then when um when covid with the pandemic happened congress passed a number of stimulus bills and in one of those that level the cap two and a half million was increased to seven and a half million included more people so it included a, a a huge number of right. uh, more of more still of small traditional businesses, businesses but, yeah. but, but it went from medium. two and a half to seven and a half million yeah. and so a lot of businesses are falling under that under that umbrella and then we have a little bit more of a streamlined uh, uh a reorganization process for those so, so a few minutes left quickly we talk about it to everybody no matter what the business COVID. how did COVID affect your business <sighs> it affected ours we in the very beginning we were crazy busy a lot of businesses were shut down um in the past i've usually i've usually charged people for consultations in business in in my practice because what you can do is spend an hour with me pick my brain get an idea and go down the street to one of the low cost uh, proprietors of my service and you get what you uh, pay we, for that. we found that we lo you know we lost uh not only that the problem with that is i would someone would come in pick my brain for an hour go hire a cheap guy then get a trustee appointed and the trustee wants to hire my firm and I now I have a conflict right. I can't even I can't even uh, serve in that but in the beginning of the pandemic to try to help people we we started doing free consultations for everybody and I was on the phone just constantly you know talking people through issues uh, a lot of businesses were struggling people were you know were struggling but then stimulus happened I think a few there were a few things that sort of propped people up um you know surprise I, I i the yeses surprise um stimulus and sympathy because uh, there were lenders that were much more sympathetic i think a lot of landlords were sympathetic to their tenants and gave you know extensions of time 
and the stimulus helped people out through through the beginning and i think we're um you know we saw a lot of businesses survive merely on those on those where um, are we going now on those tools Next two three four I, years i mean right now i think the economy is great i think we're on an, on an uptick i expect that um you know some of the the supply chain issues are going to be resolved over the near future and so unfortunately for my business but better for my community and everybody around us i think we're going to be uh, you know business ba bankruptcy lawyers are not going to be as busy as they have been and and i know we've seen it at least locally there's not as much activity in the bankruptcy world we do a lot of commercial litigation well, i'm going to so, give you the last plug yeah. on that so tell us bast amron what else do you guys do we do we're business lawyers we do commercial litigation and insolvency and our specialty is the intersection of the two uh, but we do a host of uh, partnership disputes all types of business litigation um uh, any any type of business dispute that you can think of we handle and um i always like to say that i think our because of our insolvency expertise we're the best litigators because a lot of commercial litigators know how to go and get a judgment but they don't know what to do after that once you win a trial that doesn't mean you get paid no. uh, you you do in <laughs> the world because you, you guys have insurance companies on the other side sometimes but, you got to fight for the money but though. and so we understand how to collect and we also understand what what's going to happen when the other side threatens a bankruptcy or or, or our clients the realities considering bankruptcy. of that so uh sure. we we are uh, soup to nuts we can con control a commercial litigation case all the way through conclusion through collection appeals everything, everything well, i don't else. want to get you in trouble but answer me this you said previously that at the beginning of covid you, you talk to anybody and and that's what we do you still have that mindset I, i'm still i'll still do a brief uh you know call with somebody i i have i appreciate i always wanted to do it and we only started doing the paid consultations because that it became such a you know a, such a problem people would want to spend but we will do a, a brief uh, call con consultation with someone and a lot of people want to do a paid consultation because they don't want to just talk for a few minutes they want to do the and they you know, know your pick time my is brain. valuable right and then if they retain us we credit that back against okay. the retainer amount so there are a lot of reasons why a paid consultation makes a lot of sense uh it's hard to people will say should i file bankruptcy i can't really tell you if you file not bankruptcy uh, and not in 15 minutes either and so it takes time and and a, a, there there are many ripples to the effect of a bankruptcy as i mentioned the fraudulent transfers sure. and so a lot of people don't haven't considered what the what the effect is on their business or their partners or their spouse or or the family Respect in the and community so, and, and or, how that would how that those things work, work all right so jeff tell us a little bit about now last thing how do I call you? How do I get in touch with you? What's the best way to reach you? There's a lot of different ways to reach me. Obviously, our website at bastamron.com, our office. Uh, I, I, I can give the phone number 305-379-7904. Uh, you could email me my first initial and last name at, at the firm name. So jbast at bastamron. We also have a podcast, which you can, you, talk about that. you can hear it on Spotify or Apple iTunes or on YouTube or on our website or anywhere you get your you podcast. You were kind enough to let me be a, a guest on that. We how, recently where, had you I, as a guest. How do I find it? Where do I look up? What? It's it's called The Practice Podcast. If you look up Bast Amron, that's really the best way to get to it. If you okay. search Bast Amron in, in Apple or iTunes or you send me an email, I'll send it to you. Uh, we had an episode with Mitch. It's going to be released in a couple of weeks. And we have, I think we're up to 55 episodes. I think you were, you might have been 55 awesome. episodes. And we we talk law, business, life. And um, it was a great podcast. It was educational. It, it's doing the same thing that we're doing here um, in their specialty. And then they bring on different guests to talk about different things. Uh, I know I had a great time. You were a wonderful host. And um, all right. I want to thank you very much, Jeff, for being here today. I want to thank our, Mitch. thank you. Thank our viewing audience. Um, we wish everybody a happy, healthy holiday season. And that's all from Law Talk.